Happy Friday, everyone. I hope you are healthy. I hope you're well, and I hope you're taking care of yourself. I know that we continue to battle this coronavirus, but as we battle it, we're making some progress. The governor actually just wrapped up a briefing where he talked about how about 20 counties in Pennsylvania, albeit counties um, that are less populated in sort of the northwest and north central part of our Commonwealth, are going to begin to gradually reopen and talked a little bit about southwestern Pennsylvania counties probably being next. We are making progress. Now is the time to capitalize on the good work we've done as Pennsylvanians to see this through uh, to defeat COVID-19. And as we deal with this public health crisis, I remain very mindful of the fact that there's an economic crisis that we're battling today and we'll be battling probably for years from now. And so there's a lot of helpful resources that we've put into effect to both protect consumers and to make sure that consumers get the help that they need from their bank, uh, from the unemployment office, whatever the case may be. And so I encourage you to check out on my website, attorneygeneral.gov slash COVID-19, a whole list of resources for those of you who are struggling, for those of you who are challenged right now, we're here to help. So make sure you go and, and check that out. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the other work that our office is doing. You've heard me reference a couple of times that um, we will be before the United States Supreme Court um, on May 6th, next week at 10 a.m., making an argument to the court that we need to protect women's access to contraception in this country. Contraception is medicine. And what President Trump would like to see is that CEOs across this country would have the ability, based on their own definition of morality, to deny their employees, to deny women in their companies, access to contraception. We think that is wrong. We know that it's illegal. And we've won in court multiple times. I'm joined today, uh, momentarily here, I'm joined today, a special guest and a partner um, in this effort from Planned Parenthood, Pennsylvania. I'm joined by Melissa Reed. There's Melissa. How are you, Melissa? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. It's very good to have you on. Um, and it's really good to, to see your face. And we're really grateful for Planned Parenthood's efforts to not just help us prepare for what's going to be an historic argument in the United States Supreme Court, but we're grateful for the work that Planned Parenthood does every single day. Uh, to help women and families all across Pennsylvania. Before we get into that, Melissa, let me just ask, how are you doing? You holding up? Everything going okay for you in these crazy times? I appreciate you asking. Yes, I'm well. My family's well, thankfully. And even more importantly, uh, the staff at Planned Parenthood Keystone has really leaned in to make sure that they are safe and our patients are safe so they can continue to get the care they need. And have you been able, I'm glad to hear you're doing well, and I'm glad to know that they're doing well, all things considered, of course. Are, they're still on the front lines, right? I mean, they're still helping women, helping families, delivering vital health care for people. Am I right about that? You're absolutely correct. Planned Parenthood provides essential health care services. Reproductive and sexual health care has been deemed essential by our governor. And so we have kept our doors open and delivered on that promise every day. That's great. So now, let me just ask on a personal note, you're a Tar Heel, right? Am I correct about that? <laughs> yes. Okay. So Duke, North Carolina, do you, where do you come down on that? On, the, on, on Tar Heels? Yeah, you got to be a North, you're a North Carolina fan, not a Duke fan, I assume. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a Blue Devil person. No, that's true. That's true. Great. I would say Tar Heels for sure. <laughs> and, and you, you began your career helping women and families in North Carolina. And tell us about um, your migration here to the the Keystone State. Well, actually, I, I started my career working for women and families even earlier than when I lived in North Carolina in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 80s. I ran a battered women's shelter for many years, and um, then a Ronald McDonald house, and then um, came to North Carolina and began my work in sexual and reproductive health care and justice um, I was recruited to take the CEO role at PP Keystone four years ago, and that was my first time living in Pennsylvania. And I, I'll tell you, it's the most beautiful place I've ever lived in my life. 
It is great. Well, we're glad to have you here and glad to have you on the team that's helping us prepare for oral argument on May 6th. Now, you know, this is going to be a different argument. It's historic for many reasons. Number one, because Pennsylvania uh, is going to be on the front lines of a case to actually protect women's reproductive rights, unlike maybe a few decades ago. And so we're excited about that. We know that's historic, but it's also historic because it's going to be done over the phone and the public will be able to listen in on it and pay attention to the argument, hear our attorneys make the case, hear the justices ask questions, hear the other side um, make their case. So it's a start for so many reasons. Um, folks have heard me on Instagram go on and on about the importance of this and, and explain the case, but maybe you could take a minute and explain it from your perspective. What's at stake here on May 6th? What is this really all about in practical terms for women all across Pennsylvania and really indeed all across the United States? Yeah, well, first, let me thank you, because your leadership has been tremendous, not only on this case, but really on protecting the health care rights of citizens in Pennsylvania since you took office. So thank you so much. Thank you. In this case in particular, quite simply, will determine whether or not an employer or a university can deny health insurance that covers birth control based on their personal moral objection. So it's further than a religious objection in this case. Right. It's a personally held moral belief. And these uh, rules could really have far-reaching detrimental um, ramifications to people who rely on birth control in this country. In fact, under the Affordable Care Act, 62 million women got no-cost birth control for the very first time, and that included 17 million Latino women and 15 million Black women. Because, I mean, quite frankly, birth control is basic health care. It's basic health care and it's medicine. And, you know, before the Affordable Care Act, um, it was really unaffordable for a lot of people. You know, we, we focus on the public health side of this, but one in three women struggled to afford their contraception before the Affordable Care Act came into play. So this is not only a, a health care issue, I think it's, it's an economic issue. And I think you see that on the front lines every day, right? That is absolutely true. In fact, what we know is that access to birth control is responsible for one third of women's wage gains over men um, relative to men since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And having access to the pill has really been the driver in enabling women to access college. And right. unintended pregnancy is the number one reason that girls would drop out of high school. So having the ability to to um, make those personal reproductive um, decisions and have access to the care they need uh, really helps women make those economic gains and achieve the life and, and create the family that they want. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Now, we began this legal journey back in 2017. We filed the first lawsuit in the nation and we won. We won multiple times in court. and. You know, some folks would say, well, what does it mean that you won? Well, we, we got an injunction in place, meaning we stopped the president from being able to do what he wanted, which was to give these employers the ability to just deny women access to contraception. We're really proud of that win. Obviously, now the United States Supreme Court will ultimately have the say over whether or not these regulations go into effect. But I'm wondering if you could help explain to people watching what it means that we've won in court over the last two and a half years, that the injunction's been in place. What has that meant for women over the last two and a half years that they've had this access? Put it in some practical terms for us. Well, what that has meant, like particularly for Planned Parenthood Keystones patient, yeah. is, is that of the 22,000 people we see, that they can come in and get the health care, the birth control that best fits their lifestyle, that best fits their parenting decisions whenever they need it at very low or no cost. Planned Parenthood sees 90,000 patients every year just in Pennsylvania, and the vast majority of those come to us for birth control. So that, you know, as you know, millions across the country, nine in 10 women use birth control at some point in her lifetime. Right. I, I think the statistic is, you know, women uh, spend about uh, four or six years trying and being pregnant and 
three decades trying to prevent pregnancy. And, and so this really makes the difference in families um, being able to, to manage um, their, their economic well-being, especially in such difficult times. Tell me about the families that you think, you know, based upon the, the families that you see, and obviously don't tell me anyone specifically, but generally speaking, you know, if the Supreme Court rules in Donald Trump's favor here and employers are able to deny women access to contraception because of their own moral beliefs, and I, I should state, because I think this is a confusing point to some, we're not talking about church groups and church organizations. They're already exempt. And in right. fact, my office has not opposed that exemption. They can have that exemption. We're talking about a, a for-profit publicly traded company where the CEO just believes women shouldn't have contraception. Women shouldn't be in the workplace, whatever that CEO might believe, you know, something as crazy as that. Tell me who gets impacted by that? Who do you see every day when they have to now fork over more than a thousand bucks every year just for contraception? Who's worse off? Who's harmed by that? Well, you know who's seriously harmed is those people that have, we have been relying on that we call essential workers in mm -hmm. this time of the pandemic, right? It's these low wage earners that we have literally been relying on to keep um, our pantries full, to take us to work, to serve us at the hospitals. And these are the people who are impacted. And we know that women of color, especially black women, face greater challenges barriers to care, right? Their access to care has always been unequal right. um, because of race disparities and racism in our country. And so denying them access to health care like birth control will create even greater burdens on these communities. I appreciate you highlighting those communities because actually a byproduct of this pandemic is that we are seeing laid bare the, the challenges that exist in communities of color Mm -hmm. in communities where poverty is high, where this uh, crisis is impacting them both on the health side because they, they are more at risk to COVID-19 and the negative effects of that because they haven't had ongoing health care, maybe the way you have had or I've been blessed to have. Um, and the economic challenges are so much more pronounced. And that, those are the people that you're seeing every day who would again be harmed by the court making the kind of decision that we hope uh, they won't make, right? Am I right about that? You're absolutely right. And, and, and let's be clear, everyone has the right to be safe and healthy, right? And yeah. birth control is critical, time-sensitive medication. It treats serious conditions. It allows people to plan if and when they get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, during this time, it's even more important to their, people's survival. Yeah, I agree. Well, let me ask you, so you and, and your legal team have been very helpful to us as we've prepared to go to court on on May 6 and make this argument. Um, will you be watching or will you be listening to the argument? I am going to try to be listening to the argument. I'm excited. It'll be the first time I've ever gotten to listen live. So that's really cool, especially for a lawyer, right? Just being a total yeah. geek about it. Right. It's going to be pretty neat. Um, so I do, I do plan to listen live, but um, it might be intermittent because, you know, we're working really hard to keep our um, doors open, keep patients served. And, and I'm excited about all we're doing in telehealth um, to, to continue to push out care, even to the most rural counties in Pennsylvania right now. Well, um, for those of you watching, if you're a geek like me and Melissa and enjoy um, <laughs> the Supreme Court, or even if you're not a geek, you just care about these, these issues because they're incredibly important, we have a link set up through my website, attorneygeneral.gov. We've got a special landing page uh, for this case, which is Pennsylvania versus Trump, and you'll be able to listen live to the argument um, on May 6th. Melissa, let me give you um, an opportunity to talk uh, more broadly about uh, Planned Parenthood's work. You know, Planned Parenthood enjoys just incredibly broad uh, support, um, broad bipartisan support. Um, the public, I know, appreciates the work you do. But I know that there's also um, a group of folks out there who uh, sometimes like to attack Planned Parenthood um, for whatever their political agenda is. 
And oftentimes they will misrepresent the work you do. T take a minute and explain just the, the, the depth and breadth uh, of what Planned Parenthood does every day. Because I know it's, it's, a, it's a broad range of issues. I've been to a number of Planned Parenthood health centers and I'm always you know, marveling at not just the great people you have working there, but the vast amount of healthcare you deliver. So maybe take a minute and, and educate folks about the work you do at Planned Parenthood. Well, thank you. I'm happy to, because as you said, uh, have suggested, Planned Parenthood does provide a wide range of reproductive and sexual health care uh, for Pennsylvanians every day. And that includes birth control, which we've been talking about, STI testing and treatment, breast, cervical, testicular cancer screenings, and it includes gender-affirming care, PrEP and PEP, and some of our Planned Parenthood locations also offer limited primary care. So it's a very broad range of care. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we have pivoted so that in the since March, we've been offering all of those services almost online through telehealth, which we're really excited about. Um, we have in-clinic appointments available also for, for things that really need a hands-on service, like an IUD mm -hmm. insertion or whatever. But then also next week, we're launching at-home STI testing and treatment. So I'm really excited wow. about that. Yep. And then we also have a mobile app called PP Direct that people can download on their phone, get birth control or at UTI, urinary tract infection testing and treatment, and have um, birth control delivered straight to their door within 24 hours or to their near, nearby pharmacy. It really helps keep people safe during this time. So there's so much we are doing to keep Pennsylvanians healthy and cared for right now. That's amazing. Now, what if um, a woman in Pennsylvania wants to access your services? Do they have to have a special card? Do they have to make a certain amount of money? Do they have to live in a certain area? Who can come in and benefit from those great services? Well, Planned Parenthood Keystone serves 37 of our counties, so mostly the eastern half of Pennsylvania, but our affiliate, our sister affiliates, you know, cover Philadelphia and Pittsburgh in the western area. And no, you don't need, we do take all, all commercial insurance. We take Medicaid, but then, um, we also take cash paying patients and those, uh, the cost of those services are based on income and on a sliding scale. So we really work hard to meet the patient where they are and deliver that care to them no matter what. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate your perspective and appreciate all that Planned Parenthood, Keystone, and all of Planned Parenthood does um, to help women and families across our Commonwealth. Uh, the work you do is really uh, essential, which is a word that uh, we're all using now. It's life-saving, uh, and it's critically important. And we in the Office of Attorney General here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are proud to have your support as we get ready to go to the Supreme Court uh, to defend women's access to contraception and stand up against this wrong-headed, illegal rule put forth by uh, the Trump administration. So we're grateful for your help. And I usually um, close out these segments with all the negative news out there. Um, I try to focus on some positive, right? And I grew up at a time where we watched Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers famously said, uh, in times of crisis, look for the helpers. So I look for helpers all across the community, and I, I tend to end with one helper. I'm going to actually end with two, with your permission, okay? Um, so my first group of helpers that I want to highlight today are all of the women and men who work for you at Planned Parenthood, who do that incredible work that you do um, on the front lines. And so thank you uh, to all of them. And the second helper I want to highlight today are the Luberto family. They're the owners of Fabulous Foods, okay? If anybody's had Fabulous Foods, make sure you add that to the chat here. You got to hear this story, okay? They contracted and then recovered, thank God, from COVID-19. But they weren't done there. They weren't just grateful to, to have recovered from COVID-19. They actually turned their catering business around and used it to provide nourishment and food and, and sustenance to workers in hospitals and testing labs across wow. Pennsylvania to make sure that they had free food to keep them going. So to Liberto family, first and foremost, we're glad you're healthy. Uh, but second, thank you for being one of the helpers. We really appreciate you uh, very much. And um, I really appreciate 
Um, you, Melissa Reed, being on uh, the General's briefing today. Thank you to Planned Parenthood for all they do. And folks, uh, believe it or not, the weekend is coming. Today is Friday. I don't know if you're like me, you've lost track uh, of all days, um, but it is the weekend. And try and do what you can to take, you know, continue to take care of your physical health. Uh, I know we continue to talk about making sure you wash your hands really well, cough with your elbow, practice physical distancing, um, but get outside, get some fresh air, and make sure you're taking care of your mental health this weekend too. Uh, try and take a break, turn off the news a little bit too. It's all right not to follow every second of this and do what you can um, to help clear your head a little bit. We're gonna be in this for um, a bit longer here, but we're making good progress. And it's thanks to the great people of Pennsylvania. So appreciate y'all being with us. Have a safe and healthy and happy weekend. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody soon. And don't forget to tune in on May 6th to hear us argue before the United States Supreme Court. Thanks. Good luck, thank you.